Well, good morning, Calvary Chapel. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Y buenos días a todos. So glad to be with you guys. If you have a chance, go ahead and take your seat and open up to the book of Romans, chapter 3. We're so blessed to be uh, tuning in with Puerto Rico again this morning. So bienvenidos a nuestra familia en Puerto Rico. And we're so glad all of you guys are joined with us as well. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, and uh, if you are there, <clears throat> let's read together, guys, from verses 21 down to 25, okay? Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 25. Title of our message is, Is God Really This Good? Is God Really This Good? And so Romans chapter 3, I'll read it in English, then in Spanish. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. And for those who speak Spanish, pero ahora, sin la mediación de la ley, se ha manifestado la justicia de Dios, de la que dan testimonio la ley y los profetas. Esta justicia de Dios llega mediante de la fe en Jesucristo a todos los que creen. De hecho, no hay distinción, pues todos han pecado y están privados de la gloria de Dios. Pero por su gracia son justificados gratuitamente mediante la redención que Cristo Jesús efectuó. Dios lo ofreció como un sacrificio para obtener el perdón de pecados, el cual se recibe por la fe en su sangre. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. And Lord, you desire that we would know how good you really are. Lord, many times we doubt your goodness. Lord, many times when we read about your love or we hear about your grace, Lord, sometimes we do. We honestly ask ourselves, even just in our minds, are you, Lord, really this good? Sometimes we hear people say that, Lord, but sometimes in our own hearts, we, we wonder, could it really be this good? Are you really this loving? Is, is it really this free, this wonderful? And so, Lord, we just pray that you'd open up our eyes this morning, Holy Spirit, Teach us the things that have already been freely given to us by you, Lord. Open up our eyes, Lord. Help us to see your goodness and your grace and your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, strange question for you as we get going this morning, but have you ever been scammed? Have you ever had somebody uh, take money from you, swindle you out of some of your finances, or some property, or something like that. Scams are something, unfortunately, in this day and age of technology and communication and internet and social media, uh, the scam alert is quite high. An article came out in May of 2024, just a few months back, and it said that these are the top five scams to watch out for. One of the scams was job scams. Job scams. Criminals they post fake job offers, and then they have a virtual interview with people with official-looking emails, and then they offer you the job. And all I need to do is fill out paperwork and send them some money, of course, to cover the cost of your computer, phone, and other business essentials. So watch out for job scams. Another scam that this article mentioned was social media scams. These are scams designed to part you from your passwords, your personal information, and other credentials. So be careful for that. Of course, some of us don't even really use social media. But for the younger generation, man, that's a really big thing. Social media scams. A third one, student loan scams. These scams start off as robocalls, emails, or online ads that promise to help you apply for federal or other aid. And they can even promise to eliminate loans that you already have. And then, of course, they're fallacious and they get things from you. 
The government even tries to get in on those sometimes, don't they? Student loan scams. Another one which uh, has recently come up are cryptocurrency scams. Big promises of profits or returns if you buy cryptocurrency. And then occasionally criminals demand payment via cryptocurrency to avoid being tracked. So watch out for that. But also another big one is AI phone call scams. Criminals incorporate artificial intelligence to replicate the voices of your loved ones. And then they'll urge, they'll use urgency and fear to get your money. So whether it's AI, uh, phone call scams, cryptocurrency scams, student loans, social media, or job scams, scams abound today. And then, of course, towards youth, there's some kind of scams that are out there towards older people or retirees. But scams really are everywhere. And why do I bring this up? Because unfortunately, we can import this kind of thinking to God. And what I mean is, like I said, we can read things in Scripture. We, we read about God's love, about God's goodness, about God's blessing, and how it's all for free. You don't have to do anything, but God offers you everything in return. And even if we don't say it sometimes, I, I just personally think that there's a little part of us on the inside where we wonder if this might be a scam, and we ask ourselves the question, or we hear other people say, is God really this good? Could that really be true? And a lot of people, they just answer the question, and they say, no, God isn't that good. No, that's not possible. And because they answer no to that question, they remain unbelievers. But even some of us as Christians, and I've been like this myself, you're, you're a Christian, the Lord lives inside of you, and you love Jesus, you are born again, but there are certain things about the gospel, certain things about the Christian life and the new covenant that we learn, maybe you've never heard it before, maybe it's, it's newer, it's fresher, it's bigger, and it's better than anything you've ever learned in your Christian life, and you think that can't possibly be true. So you'll stay a Christian, but you'll go through the rest of your Christian life with a kind of poverty that you don't need to have. You will lack joy, even though infinite joy is available to you. You'll condemn yourself. You'll live in guilt or in private shame, even though Scripture says there is zero condemnation for those in Jesus. And many of us as Christians go through life as spiritual beggars when the Lord offers us incredible, incredible abundance. Now, why do I say this? Is God really this good? Well, because in our verse that we just read... I don't know if it stood out to you because there was a lot, of, a lot of content in what we just read, but listen to what Paul told us in verses 21 down to, you know, about verse 24. 21 to 23, listen to what Paul told us. Paul just told us what we just read, that there is a new way to be made righteous with God. That's what he told us, right? Because Paul told us, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. And, and the, uh, the interesting parts of this verse, I think, are in the beginning where it says, but now. And right here in Romans chapter 3, uh, many of us think that this is the hinge upon which the door of Romans Swings Just like every door in this church or in your house has a hinge. And the door, even if it's a massive door, it will swing, it'll pivot on a little, tiny little hinge. This right here, in the book of Romans, this is where it takes a turn from the really negative to the real positive. From the really dark to now this brilliant light. Because up till this point in chapters 1, 2, and 3, remember what Paul talked about? Our message last week, if you weren't here, I encourage you to listen to that perhaps. We talked about the law's lesson. And the lesson of the law that God gave to the Jewish people was to bring a knowledge of sin. It was to magnify sin. It was to reveal the sin that they were already guilty of. It was to drive them to Jesus like a schoolmaster. And so essentially in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3... Lovingly, the Lord through Paul says the pagans are guilty, they need Jesus. The religious people are guilty and they need Jesus. And as a matter of fact, the entire world is guilty and you all need Jesus. But then he says, but now. 
But now the righteousness of God, completely separate from keeping laws, has been revealed. A way to be made right with God. There is a way, Paul's going to say, even though we are already completely condemned, we're already guilty. God doesn't condemn us. Jesus didn't come to condemn. Jesus said he came to save us. But we are already condemned because we're born in sin. And then like we talked about last week, the law showed the Jews, and it shows us too, that we are just always uh, disobeying these laws. But now apart from law, apart from rules, apart from religion, Apart from regulations, there is a path. There is one way to be made righteous. There is one way to be saved. There is one way you can become acceptable to God and be with him forever. So that's pretty amazing. Paul's making a big shift. There is a new way to be made righteous with God. And then he also told us this new way of righteousness was previewed in the Old Testament. Maybe you didn't catch that when we read through the verses, but remember what Paul said? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Paul says this over and over all throughout his writings. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, but they testify of me. Jesus told us in the volume of the book, it's written of me. And if you know your Bible friend, then you know there's almost 2,000 prophecies in the Old Testament. There are many pictures, there are many previews, there are many promises, and all of them point to Jesus Christ, and really to the gospel that he brings, the gospel that he is, and this new covenant. That's an amazing thing that Paul's now going to begin to reveal to the Romans. There is a new way of righteousness, and it was previewed in the Old Testament, and thirdly, what we read is that this new way of righteousness is only available through faith. Not law, not works, not religion and churches and synagogues. It's only available through faith, not just faith in general, faith in a particular person and faith in his particular work. Faith, trusting in Jesus, trusting in his work, trusting and believing into who he is and what he has done. It's through faith. That's absolutely new and that's pretty amazing. And number four, what Paul also told us in what we just read, is that this new way of righteousness is available to every single person on the globe. All of humanity, Gentile or Jew, religious or unreligious, educated or uneducated, poor or rich, or anything in between, all of humanity, this new way of righteousness. Because he told us, to all and on all, who just believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, Paul's telling us that there is a universal need. He told us about that, right, in the first three chapters. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And since there is a universal need, now Jesus has come with a universal offer that you can be saved. And what I'm trying to say is that when people hear this, when they hear there's a new way to be made righteous, there's a new way that was previewed in the Old Testament, this new way is only through faith. You don't have to do anything because you can't. And number four, it's available to all people. The skeptic will quickly say what? Is God really this good? Or maybe they'll phrase it a little differently and they'll say, is this good news too good to be true? You know, I know people that have told me that literally to my face. Some people in my own family. And you sit there and you talk about Jesus and you talk about the love of God. And God became a man and shed his blood for the sins of the world, rose from the grave. And all you do is receive it. And I've literally had people in my own blood family tell me, it can't be that easy. It can't be that good. No way. And then other people who are Christians, and they are born again, at least I think so, they hear other aspects of the good news. They hear other aspects of this new covenant inheritance and riches we have. And they say, well, that sounds different than what I grew up with in religion. That sounds a little too good to be true. But it really is, guys. It really is true. 
And this is why the good news is called good. I think we should call it the great news. It is the greatest news ever on the planet. And the new covenant is just this unsearchable riches of Jesus. Paul then goes on to tell us in verse 24 and 25. Let's read those together. We're going to focus on those. I like to describe this. This might sound strange to you, but just bear with me. I like to describe verses 24 and 25 as kind of a spiritual chain reaction of God's grace. And what I mean by that is, I'm going to read verses 24 and a little bit of 25, and listen to the words, because Paul is going to take five words, at least the way that I see it, he's going to take five amazing words, which we're going to look at, and he links them together, kind of like five links in a chain. And he actually starts with, you being a Christian right now, and then he kind of goes backwards. So let's just read it together. This is a chain reaction of God's grace. And if you think what he said before was great, you haven't heard anything yet. Because it just gets so amazing, it's too good for some people to believe. But it is absolutely true. Verse 24. After finishing and saying, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that there's this universal need. But now he tells us, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. And those five words, this is what I mean by links in a chain. Each one of them is pregnant with meaning. We're going to look at those five words. But justify. Jesus says, now as a Christian, if Christ is inside of you, not if you're in a church, not if you have a King James Bible, not if you know lots of verses and you do lots of religious things. No, if Jesus lives inside of you, that is what it means to be a Christian. That it, that's what it means to be saved, is the living God comes into you and you come alive. He says, if that's true, you are justified. God has declared you not guilty of anything. And actually, he's given you perfect righteousness. That's who you are right now, already. But then he kind of goes backwards. And then he says, you're justified freely. In other words, you're justified, but that's because it came to you without cost. You had, you had to do nothing because you could do nothing to receive it. And then he goes back further and he says, you're justified because it came to you freely. And then he says, and that came to you because of the grace of God. Grace is something that you don't deserve but receive anyway. But then he goes back even further and he says, you are justified freely without cost because it came to you in grace. And that happened because Jesus achieved redemption for you. Let's go back to those five words. Redemption. Grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, the act of redemption happened because even before that, Jesus accomplished something called propitiation. He was a sacrifice. He became a sacrifice that removed the sin of the world. So I don't know if you can follow my train of thought there. Sometimes the way that a teacher will see something is a little bit different. But I see these as five links in a chain you could call it a chain reaction of grace. And it seems to me that Paul starts with, this is who you are right now, but it's only because all these things had previously happened. So let's, let's look at those five words in the remaining time that we have. And we're going to look at them from the back to the front, from past to present. In other words, uh, we're going to start off with the word propitiation in 25, and then we're going to work our way back up to the word justified, okay? Because that's where it really all began, propitiation. <clears throat> Paul said that Jesus became a propitiation for you. Now, many of us, we don't even understand what this is. And let me just say really, really quickly that these, these $100 words, these million-dollar words in the Bible, it's good, I think, to keep them like this propitiation. Many of our modern translations and so forth, they try to change them, and I understand for doing that. I love modern translations, but I just want to encourage each of you that there are these thousand dollar golden beautiful words in scripture, they're translations, words like propitiation, redemption, reconciliation, salvation, and I know that you're tempted to think, yeah, but that's a big fancy word. Well, I understand what you mean, but man, it's an important word, and they're pregnant with meaning. I'd encourage 
encourage you to look into what they mean. Because this right here describes a beautiful thing that Christ has done for us. Jesus was made a propitiation for us. What does this mean? Well, propitiation, the original word, is the word helasterion. Helasterion, sometimes it takes a different form. And what that means, as you can see, a sacrifice that absorbs wrath or absorbs the sin and then removes it. So this is a word from the world of religion. Helasterion, propitiation, it is a word from the, from the world of sacrifice, okay? So you can think of like a lamb being tied up, like maybe the Passover lamb. So to the ancient Jew, this would mean the Passover lamb from Exodus or the scapegoat from Leviticus. These are different kinds of offerings and sacrifices. They had so many of these in their religious system. But a propitiation, and this also existed outside in the pagan religions, which of course were false and there was absolutely no power there. But the idea of propitiation is the idea that this is an animal or a person or some kind of sacrifice where there is wrath that I deserve, there is wrath that a person deserves, but in my place steps someone else. In my place steps the, the animal, the sacrifice, the person, and they come in between me and the wrath that I deserve, and they absorb all the wrath so that I don't have to. They also absorb all of the sin that I have committed and the wrath and the sin and all of that, it's taken away and it's removed. That's important to understand because the Jewish system was based upon covering sin. Uh, like, like, you know, some of your kids, you know, you'll ask them to sweep the floor and if your kid doesn't want to do a lot of work, instead of getting the dustpan, sweeping it up, taking it to the garbage can, where is he going to sweep it? Under the under the rug. Check your rugs when you get home. You never know. So, you know, and, and this is oftentimes, this is what happened in the Old Testament. It was just temporarily covered, but no more. Propitiation, helasterion, helasmas, that God himself became a man and that Christ absorbed the infinite fury and wrath of God against the sin of all of humanity. And as I understand it, he absorbed it into himself. He paid for it and he completely removed it and took it away. Absolutely incredible. It sounds too good to be true, but it is true because it had to happen this way. This is what John meant in, in uh, 1 John 2, 2, when he said, he himself is the propitiation. John loves this word more than anybody else. He himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and notice what he says here, for our sins, but not ours only, for the sins of the entire world. These verses cause some people in Reformed theology or Calvinism a lot of problems, but there it is. You've got to deal with it. That's what the Bible says, that the sins of the entire world were paid for. In John 1.29, that reference that you see at the bottom, remember John the Baptist? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away. Now, that was from a Jewish prophet, John the Baptist, last prophet of the Old Testament. And for him to say that sin was going to be taken away was a remarkable thing. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Exodus 12, it talks about the Passover lamb. And in Leviticus 16, it talks about the scapegoat. Taking away the sin. That's what propitiation does. It absorbs it. This word, uh, propitiation, it's only used a handful of times in the New Testament. One of them is in Hebrews 9.5. And depending on who you think wrote the book of Hebrews, it was used here. It's translated mercy seat in your Bible. And so the mercy seat, if you remember, this was the lid that covered the Ark of the Covenant. But you remember that little throne, that seat, that mercy seat on the lid covering that box, it was sprinkled with blood uh, on the, the Day of Atonement, I believe. And that also is an interesting picture because do you remember what's inside the Ark of the Covenant? Remember Indiana Jones? Do you remember what's inside? You know, read your Bible, actually. What's inside the Ark of the Covenant? Three articles of rebellion. Three instances, mementos, memorial uh, of the rebellion of Israel in the desert. Second set of Ten Commandments, 
the, the, the jar of manna and Aaron's rod that budded. Each one of those are instances of rebellion, but they were put into this wooden box that was covered in gold. It was then, it was encased with mercy, it was topped with mercy, and then sprinkled with blood. And that's propitiation, in a sense. Because you see, the, the lid was, was over, it was covering over, it was in between the items of rebellion and wrath, and the blood was sprinkled on it. And so you see, this is what Jesus did. Jesus stepped in between us and in between wrath. No wonder Jesus was sweating so much right before he was arrested in the garden. Remember that verse where it says that Jesus was sweating great drops of blood? That's a real medical condition. It's called hematidrosis or hematidrosis, where the, the, your skin opens up and your blood capillaries and you're so nervous and, and, and you're almost in shock. And so your blood vessels, uh, they, they open up and, and sweat mingled with blood comes out of your face and out of your body and your skin is horribly sensitized as though you had a sunburn, and that was how Jesus felt hours before. They punched him, and they whipped him, and they ripped out his hair. He was so nervous because he understood what he was going to become. He volunteered. He chose to say, Father, they can't handle it. I am going to absorb all the wrath for them. That's what Jesus did for you. And again, some people say, is God really this good? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Jesus substituted your place. Jesus absorbed the wrath of God, all of it on your behalf. He paid for all of your sins and completely removed them forever. And that's just the first word. See, that's, that is true right now because you're, you're a Christian. So that's absolutely beautiful. So that's propitiation. Jesus did that. But then he says, the, the propitiation, that was the last word, and then redemption. You see, because, because of the propitiation, then redemption, it was then kind of utilized, it acted out as redemption for humanity. We have redemption in Jesus. Now this word redemption, it's kind of well known to us, but the, the meaning meaning of the actual word is so fascinating. It has a lot of different understandings. It's the word apolutron, right, which comes from two words. Apo means to come out of, and lutron or lutruo means to buy. So apolutron, it means to, it, the ransom price that is paid for the release of prisoners of war, or the ransom price that is paid for hostages, or sometimes it's used for the purchase price for slaves to be freed. That's what apolitron, that's what it means. I mean, it makes me think of the, the 120 hostages that were taken in Israel recently. Horrible act of terrorism on October the 7th, and they estimate that out of the 120 hostages, maybe half of them are still alive. And if a ransom price would be accepted, uh, wouldn't we all want to have these prisoners of war and these hostages released? But this is also really the language of the slave market of the ancient world. This is the language of the slave market with their, their shackles and their chains. This is where this word comes from. And this is, this is a horrible thing. We don't like to think about this. Slavery is a wicked, sinful, evil thing. But this is not talking about, of course, in the 1800s in America. This is going back to the ancient world. Slavery, human trafficking, has existed from the beginning of time, every culture, every race, all of that, unfortunately. But this is the idea that in the Greek, Roman, and Hebrew culture that you could buy a slave out of the slave market. You could, you could purchase their freedom, and sometimes it was to have them serve you for a day, and then you would bring them back. A higher price, they would, they would stay with you for, for quite a while. Maybe you could, could own them, although I, I believe obviously that's thoroughly wrong. Or the, one of the greatest forms of redemption of a palutron was to pay for them out of the slave market and then you set them free. So you buy them to become a free man, a free woman, and they're set free forever. And that's the word that's used of us in scripture. Jesus achieved redemption for you. This absolute freedom. 
People say slavery to what? He, he told this to the Jewish people in John chapter 8, and they said, we've never been slaves to anyone, which wasn't true. They were enslaved to Assyria, to Babylon, even when Jesus said that they were under the oppression of Rome. But people today, right, they say redeemed, saved from slavery to what? Slavery to sin. The Bible clearly teaches us that the person who engages and lives in sin is a slave to sin. And Jesus, in Colossians 1.14, Paul told us, we have redemption. We have a palutron, how? Through his blood. And then he tells us what happened, the forgiveness of sins. So because the propitiation sacrifice was made, that effected and accomplished your redemption. The ransom price, the hostage price, the slavery price, whatever way you want to think about it, it was paid for sin, and sin was forgiven. Sin was paid for, sin was released, the debt was canceled, it's at zero, and a person is free. But 2 Corinthians 5.19, one of the greatest verses, I think, in the New Testament on forgiveness, it tells us how deep the forgiveness runs, how deep the redemption is that Jesus accomplished. He says, God was, the Father, God was in Christ reconciling how many people? The world. Now, that's a, now, reconciliation is a different word than redemption, but there are a lot of similarities. Paul loves reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You could equally say redeeming. No longer imputing or counting their sins against them. So if redemption is for sin, and if the redemption of Jesus worked, if it achieved forgiveness... How many people did Paul the Apostle just tell us were forgiven, were redeemed, were reconciled when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood? How many people were forgiven? God was in Christ, reconciling the, the world. Hey guys, listen, sound too good to be true? Jesus paid the blood price for all sin of the world on the cross. And when I mean all, I mean all. Capital letters, boldened, underlined. All sin is forgiven except there is a sin of a kind of a different category, the rejection of Jesus Christ. First John, I believe he calls it the sin that leads to death. This appears to be, it's the worst sin of all. It's in a category alone by itself. But all these other sins, lying and cheating and stealing and so forth, all that sin was forgiven. And every human is forgiven completely. Right here as we stand today, every human is forgiven completely, but not yet saved. That's important to understand. Forgiveness is not the same as salvation. Many people, you know, many of us were raised thinking and many, many people are confused and they think that redemption equals salvation. And I, and I know what you mean. I used to think that too, but it doesn't. Redemption is different than regeneration. Forgiveness is not the same as salvation. Now, redemption and forgiveness had to happen to wipe the slate clean, to put the balance at zero so that a person could now come to God and receive Christ into their hearts and then come alive and be saved. But isn't that just an amazing, amazing thing? I, I didn't used to know this, and, and the Lord has shown me, the Lord has shown us that through Jesus Christ, you know, the gospel and the good news is greater than I ever thought possible. The forgiveness of God, the love of God for this world through Jesus Christ exceeds anything I ever possibly could imagine. The entire sin of every human on the planet is already forgiven completely. They're totally forgiven and they're not yet saved, but that's the one thing that remains. If they'll just turn to Jesus Christ and receive him into their hearts, uh, they're born again. Absolutely amazing. But yet people hear this and they say, is God really that good? And the answer would be, yes. 
Yes, yes. We have redemption. Jesus accomplished redemption for the entire globe. So he accomplished propitiation, that sacrifice. That led to then redemption, the price being paid and the sin debt of the world being taken down to zero. No negative balance, just zero. And then Paul goes on to tell us that all happened because of a thing called grace. A thing called grace. The only reason the propitiation which became this redemption happened is because God is gracious. Now what is grace? What is grace? We could talk about it for a long time, but the word itself is the word charis. And charis in the original language, it means God's love, God's kindness that we don't deserve, but it's poured upon us anyway. I often think of Niagara Falls. <clears throat> We're right here in the proximity of Niagara. And whether you're good or bad, Niagara pours on you, doesn't it? Whether you are awake or asleep, Niagara continues to pour. Whether it's summer or winter, Niagara pours. And that's just a word picture that really blesses my own life. God's grace, he is always gracious to us, even when you fail him, even when you don't really seek after him. God's grace just pours and pours. His love, his grace, like Niagara, just pours constantly. God's grace. His love and his kindness that we don't deserve, but it's poured out upon us anyway. Uh, God did it. God did it all. That's a great way to define grace, as our pastor has taught us. God did all of this. He did everything. He did the propitiation. He did the redemption because he is gracious. God did all of this. We can take credit for none of this. This is nothing that we ever could create or achieve or perform. And so he had to do it all, and God did it all. And all you can do is just say, Jesus, thank you, Lord, and just receive. And that's what grace is. I heard another man, another pastor, he defined grace by simply saying that the Lord, through Jesus, the Lord offers to all of humanity through the person and work of Jesus Christ everything that you really need, everything that you truly crave, and everything that is commanded by God. God offers this to you now through Jesus. It's to be received in humility and faith. And this is something you could never create or earn or deserve. That's how he defines grace. God just did it all. Some people say God's riches at Christ's expense. The propitiation and redemption, man, it just came through grace. Most of us know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Paul the apostle said, you are saved by Grace, grace, you know, that word saved, it means to be rescued, right? Soteria, so you were rescued out of death and hell and damnation and sin because God is just so good to us. I didn't deserve it, but his loving kindness reached down to me and he just did it all for me. Some people would say that grace is when one person loves another and grace, love, and kindness is given and the giver of grace takes no consideration for what they themselves are going to get out of it. Their only focus is what the receiver is going to benefit. And that surely is true. Isn't it? That's agape, divine love where you give and give and give, only thinking about oh, the, the benefits that are going to be received by that person. You are saved by grace. And Paul tells us in Romans 6, 14, that this is how you're supposed to live now as a Christian, if we understand the gospel, and as we grow in our understanding of the new covenant, we will understand and we must understand we are no longer under sin. We are no longer under the law. We are not responsible nor, nor required, nor does God want you or expect you to live up to laws and rules and, and religious regulations because you can't. The operating principle, how we're supposed to relate to the Lord, is not law, but love. He says you are not under law, but under grace. So do you live like that? You know, we should wake up every day and just live in God's grace. Lord, I, I, I messed up yesterday. Lord, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But I thank you that I'm already forgiven. And Lord, I just, I just live in your love. Did I live in your grace? Oh, Lord, you love me so much. It's like Niagara Falls. You 
did all of it. You achieved propitiation. You accomplished redemption, and it's all by grace. Lord, I live in your grace today. I'm not going to focus on my performance. I'm just going to focus on your performance, your love, your gifts of love and grace. I'm going to live in this forgiveness, this grace, Lord. That is so important. Jesus gave to us an absolutely free gift of undeserved love, unmerited kindness, and unearned blessing. I forgot to mention, but this is the language of a gift. And that's what it is. But have you ever tried to give a gift to someone and they don't want to accept it? I know you've never done that, but you know, there's those people out there and someone will come and they'll say, hey, I just want to bless you with this. I just want to give this to you. And have you ever heard somebody refuse a gift? Oh, you need some money? Here you go. And people say, oh, no, 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 no. I'll figure it out myself. And I don't know about ladies, but I just know as men, sometimes we can be prideful. Prideful. That's probably just me. It's probably never been you, right? But, you know, just, oh, I, I got to do it myself. I got to figure it out, you know? I can't take it. It'll make me look weak. It'll make me look, you know, not true. But you see, we can refuse gifts. But that's what grace is. It's a gift. God's riches at Christ's expense. And if a person will not receive God's gifts, well, then you won't be saved. If a Christian who is born again will, will choose to refuse God's gifts, you'll be saved, but you won't really have a blessed, rich, abundant life. You'll be saved, but you'll live like a beggar. You'll be saved, but you'll be living without joy. Because for whatever reason, if you refuse to receive these gifts of joy, power, peace, this abundant life of God living in you and this riches of inheritance... Well, uh, I guess you can do that if you want to, but I love gifts. I love free gifts. They're the best kind, and, and this is the only way that it can happen. Just receive it. Just receive it. That's grace. And as I said, Paul then goes on to say, and this came to you freely. Freely. He uses the word freely. And, you know, you might just read over that, but he says, that it was absolutely free. This is the word Dorian, right? Dorian, and it means without any cost, without any charge, without any cause or reason to deserve a gift, but the gift is received anyway. Zero cost. I mean, how would you like, I mean, this would be so strange, right? If somebody came up to you and they handed you keys, car keys, and they said, you know, I just want to give you this Lamborghini for free. Zero cost. And if you let them actually put the keys in your hands, would you be skeptical about that? Yes. Well, we received an email the other day, the church in Puerto Rico. Somebody said, well, I want to send you a gift of two and a half million dollars. And we we're just like, oh, what? <laughs> because I just won the lottery. But all you need to send me is eh, scam. But you see, we are skeptical when things come absolutely for free. You see, and this is, this is what I'm saying. Scam alert. We are so used to being scammed by people, and people do scam. But God doesn't and won't and actually can't scam you. And he offers things to you. He offers everything to you at zero cost. You know why? Because you can't afford it. You just can't afford it. These things cannot be bought or earned or deserved, and so God must offer it, and he does offer it freely. Dorian, no cause, no reason that you deserve it, no price that must be paid, no work that you must do. It's freely. In John 15, 25, this is the same word that Jesus used when he said, they hated me without a cause. They hated me, Dorian. They hated me for no reason whatsoever. I did nothing to deserve it, but they hated me anyway. Well, so you could say, Jesus has loved me without a cause. Jesus has redeemed me. He has given me grace and propitiation without a cause. Lord, I love you. I did nothing to deserve it. Actually, I deserve quite the opposite. But for, for, for no reason whatsoever, Lord, wow, you just lavish, like Niagara Falls, gift upon gift upon gift. It reminds me of Luke 7, 41 and 42. Pastor Dan shared this with us recently. Wonderful teaching. Jesus told a parable of, of a money lender and two people that were in debt. And he was speaking to Simon a Pharisee. 
You see, Simon thought that he was righteous, and this immoral woman came in worshiping Jesus, and Simon thought, you know, she was just really not worthy to be forgiven. And so Jesus tells Simon a parable to help illustrate the point. He says, Simon, let me tell you a story. There was a money lender, and there were two people that owed him different amounts of money, most likely representing Simon and this sinful woman. One person, Simon, owed him 5000 but the other person owed him 500000 Jesus says, but then the money lender realized that neither one of them had the resources to repay him. Even though their debts were differing amounts, even though technically this person owed less than this one, and this one owed more than this one, Jesus says, the money lender realized he could not pay his debt, and she could not pay her debt. And then Jesus said, so the money lender forgave them both. He canceled both of them. In other words, he just gave it freely. You can't afford it, and you can't afford it. And this is what we have to understand. Many of us are like Simon. We think well, I'm not Adolf Hitler. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I mean, I'm not as bad as Hitler. I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as, you know, a Jeffrey Dahmer or John Wayne Gacy. You know, I mean, I'm bad, but not really that bad. Well, if you have to cross an infinite gap, does it really matter whether you try to jump 10 feet across or 10 million feet across? Does it really matter? Are you going to be able to cross an infinite distance? No. You can try to jump to the moon, and some of us may only be able to jump three inches, and some of us maybe, the young guys, three feet, but are any of us going to reach the moon? No. And the Lord knows this. And so he has freely forgiven, absolutely freely. He freely forgave them both. And so Jesus gave this to us. He gave us his grace, his redemption, his propitiation. He gave this to us without costing us anything, without you having to do anything for it, without earning it, without creating it. He gave this to us absolutely for free as a loving, gracious, free gift from God to you. And people say, is God really this good? And what would you say? Yes, because he had to do it this way, because I just can't afford it. And then the greatest word of all, it's the first word that he started with, justified. He said that because all these things have happened, because Jesus was made a propitiation, it became redemption. And through his grace, which he freely gave, now as we sit here, having received Christ into our hearts, you're justified. And I got to tell you, this is one of the coolest words, one of the most powerful words in the New Testament, justified. And we'll just end with this one. This is what you are. This is who you are. This is your condition. This is your identity today. If Christ lives inside of you and it's worth you reading over this and digging into it, asking the Holy Spirit to show you what have you really done for me, Jesus? Who have you made me? Well, he has made you justified justified. This actually justified, this is the language of the courtroom. This is a legal word. Paul loves to use legal words and financial words. So if you can picture a gavel, kind of like that legal hammer, coming down and a judge making a declaration, this is the language that Paul is using here, that in Christ, having received Jesus, the Lord has now made a declaration about you. And here's where it takes faith. Because regardless of whether you feel this or not, regardless of whether you fully understand this or not, regardless of whether your external circumstances looks like this or not, this is true. This is who you are. This is what God has done. And he desires that you would understand it and believe it by faith and just embrace this. So justified. 
This is the word dikai au, dikai au, okay? Strange word. It's really the same word as righteousness. They're really the same root word. Justified is the adjective, and then righteousness, that's just the noun, okay? But dikai au, it means to declare a person innocent of crimes. In other words, if you committed a crime, you know you did it, and you go into the court, and for whatever reason, the judge says, I dismiss all the evidence against you, I declare Declare you innocent, boom, you're justified. That's what it means. It's this legal language that you have been declared innocent. This word means to acquit someone of guilty charges. Now, we've all seen that happen recently, haven't we? Sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't agree. But to be acquitted, there are no charges, all charges are dropped, and you walk out absolutely innocent from the court. It can also mean to declare a person in right standing with God before you are not in right standing. Now, now let me just tell you this. Let me tell you this. Even though propitiation and redemption has happened, that is the equivalent of your financial debt being brought to zero. Now, that's a great thing, right? That's a good thing. If you were $10 million in the hole, you were in debt, and the debt was brought to zero, that's a good thing. But just because a person has propitiation and redemption, you're still not right with God. Your balance is zero. You have no positive balance. You don't have righteousness. You you don't have the positive yet. You're at zero, which is better than being at infinite negative. But you're just at zero. You are not yet in right standing with God. Your account is empty. You have no positive righteousness. But that's where this word comes in. Because the moment you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, when you repent from that last sin of unbelief, you already were forgiven. Your balance was at zero because of the cross of Christ. But from the moment that Christ comes into you, all of a sudden, instantaneously you have infinite righteousness put into your account. The righteousness of Jesus actually, he himself, he is righteousness, he he becomes our righteousness, he comes into you and in financial terms your account, it floods and this this is how God sees you, but it's deeper than that, it's actually who you are. To declare a person to be in right standing with God. And that's what you got to say about yourself. Lord, I am in right standing with you. I am in right standing. I already was completely forgiven. I was actually born in forgiveness. We were talking about this this morning at the prayer meeting. I encourage you guys to come join us at 8.30 every Sunday morning. And I was talking with Rick and Julie how, how we, we didn't even know it, but we were born forgiven. Some people say, you know, dead on arrival. Well, you know what you were? Forgiven on arrival. You were born totally forgiven, though we knew it not. And though I was forgiven my whole life, when I accepted Christ by God's grace in 1998, I instantaneously right there was made righteous in Jesus, perfectly righteous. The account balance when you accepted Jesus went from zero to infinite righteousness, and that's what you are right now. Yeah, but sometimes I sin. I know, but you're still righteous. Yeah, but sometimes my flesh. I know, but you're still perfectly righteous in Jesus. Yeah, but sometimes, but you're righteous. You're in right standing with God. He lives in you. He loves you. He, he doesn't really see it like that. You're absolutely righteous in Jesus, no matter what happens. Now, this will make a person more holy, not less holy. This will make a person more like Jesus, not less like Jesus. But this is why it requires faith. And if, you, if you'll just understand this and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, you will not fall prey to sin and shame and guilt and condemnation. As so many Christians are, they're saved, but they don't understand they're justified. They don't understand that they have the righteousness of Christ, Jesus himself, in them. And so they're deceived and they live in condemnation every day of their life, and they will die thinking that God is displeased with them, thinking that God is holding something against them because they don't understand the propitiation and the forgiveness, much less this justification and infinite perfect righteousness that you have and are in Jesus. And if we could only wrap our puny little brains about this, you would be so joyful 
And you don't try to fail the Lord, but you know, sometimes we do fail. But even when you fail, you'll say, Lord, I'm so sorry. But I thank you. I thank you that you love me and I was already forgiven before I did that stupid thing and I am righteous before you, I am holy, I am perfectly justified and I have infinite righteousness at my account. Oh, thank you, Lord. Nothing has changed between us. And Paul says there's no condemnation for those in Christ. A person to be in right standing and listen, to be justified is to actually make a person right. Think about this. Not just the position that you occupy, there actually is a change deep inside of you. And this is my favorite thing to talk about, and I'm not going to mention it too much, but your inner person, your inner man, your spirit, I'm just telling you, on on the authority of the Word of God, you know, you have been made right on the inside. Scripture says that you are right. Holy, you are blameless before God. It's not an optical illusion. Oh, God doesn't see me like that. He just sees Jesus. Well, that's true. He does see Jesus, but he sees you. And scripture says that you, your spirit, you are blameless before God. You have actually been changed on the inside. And it's absolutely incredible. I don't understand all of it, but it's absolutely true. And it's so encouraging. Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Paul loves this word. uh, Dikaiao and the other one. In Romans 4, 6, in speaking of Abraham, he says, God imputes righteousness apart from works. You see, righteousness is imputed. And this is kind of a, a financial word. Just like I could transfer uh, $50,000, if I had that, into your bank account by pressing a button, I could say, I could say hey, Andrew, ready? I want to bless you. Here we go. And $50,000 is his. I imputed, I sent, I deposited righteousness, or these $50,000, into his account immediately. That's what happened when you received Jesus. Though you didn't understand it, that's okay. Knowledge isn't essential. It, Jesus came into you. He is our righteousness, and so that righteousness is imputed. That doesn't change even when you sin. That doesn't change even when you fail the Lord. That doesn't change when, you, when you're walking in the flesh or you fail the Lord. Now, he will help you to not be like that. And if you, if you walk in this and live in this, he empowers you to rise above the flesh and to live above sin. But if it does happen, nothing has changed. God doesn't turn his face away from you. You don't break fellowship with God. He loves you. He's always right there. And he can, he can comfort you and strengthen you, and he will change you into a different kind of a person. And you, you live in justification. You live in righteousness. But it was imputed to you apart from anything you did, apart from your works. Romans 4, 9, he says it again a little differently. He says, faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. It's the same financial word. It's logizomai, accounted. It's, this, is a, 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 this is like a spiritual, financial, permanent thing with God. It's accounted to you, and it never changes. It never goes away. It never falters, because if it did, if your righteousness, if my righteousness, if my justification before God could falter, how long would it take for you to lose it? About two and a half seconds right? But it it can't happen. It doesn't happen like that or nobody would go to heaven. Nobody would be saved. Accounted to Abraham and 2 Corinthians 5.21, a very mysterious but beautiful verse. After talking about how Christ was made sin, I call this the great exchange, it says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you see those words? You you take that verse home and you talk to the Holy Spirit about it. But he didn't just say that you receive God's righteousness. He didn't just say that you occupy a position of righteousness. What did he say? That we might become the righteousness of God. How righteous is God? How righteous is Jesus? How holy is Jesus? See, we don't even want to answer that, right? Perfectly. Perfectly. Guess how much righteousness you have. Guess how holy and blameless you are in God's eyes. Perfectly. Your sanctification, you're fully sanctified. You're completely made holy already. 
Yeah, but, but the way that I live, I know, I, I struggle the same way. But in your spirit and your inner man, sanctification is done. You are holy before God. But what we're growing is in how to now live that out in our lives. And I'm sure you struggle there just like I do. But you are 100% justified. Jesus has declared you 100% innocent. You are one, if you're a Christian, you are 100% blameless before him. He has acquitted you completely of any and all sin that you have done are doing or will do. He has declared you to be 100% holy, 100% righteous before him. Jesus lives inside of your heart. He has infused you with his very own holy life, with his very own spirit. He has united himself with your spirit and your new man shares in the very righteousness of God. Absolutely incredible. And so some of you right now, you might think that's a scam. You might think, is God really this good? But you know what? He is. He absolutely is. So that's all the time that I have. Uh, I talk a lot. And I just want to encourage you, listen, if you're an unbeliever here today, if you, if you have yet to receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, the application is simple. Receive. Just receive Jesus. This is not a thing you can do by yourself. This is not a thing that can be earned or deserved or created. These things are beyond any of us. And so if you are not certain that you have received Christ, as we close in worship now, I encourage you, say, Jesus, you are Lord. You died for me. You rose from the grave. Come inside of me now and give me life. Come into me. Receive Jesus if you have not. And if you are a believer, as I believe most of us are, if you're a Christian, what is the response to something like this? This is so overwhelming. Is God really this good? How should we respond as believers? Just worship Jesus. Really. And that's not just a simple answer. Just worship Jesus. Worship him now in song. Worship him in the way that you treat your family. Worship Jesus in the way that you use your money for him, your time. Worship him with your life. Worship him through good works and service. Just, just lay down your life and worship Jesus. He is worthy of, of everything. He is really this good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. And Lord, there's so much that we can talk about. There's so much to talk about. So many wonderful things, Lord, riches, things that we just understand perhaps a little. But we can already see, Lord, the vast blessings, the vast richness, this amazing inheritance, Lord, that you have become the propitiation and absorbed and removed all sin. You have redeemed us and set us completely free. You have given us all these gifts through grace without any cost to us whatsoever. And as we sit here this morning, Lord, we are 100% justified, righteous, holy, and blameless because you, the righteous one, you live in us. Lord, give us faith to believe these things. Give us faith, Lord, to live in your love, live in this righteousness that you've given us this week and help us now show us how to worship you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.